Thanks to fiction, when we think of the Victorian era, we tend to think of lavish homes, beautiful gowns, and passionate romances. But as we all know, the truth is often stranger than fiction. Smellier, too. Victorians may have had a lot of nice things, but when it came to hygiene, they were, for lack of a better term, f***ing gross. Beneath the fancy garments of lace and silk were people who had no indoor plumbing and didn't regularly bathe. Diseases were common, and the hygienic practices meant to cure them were often as bad, if not worse, than the illnesses themselves. Today, we're going to take a look at what hygiene was like in the Victorian era. But before we get started, be sure to subscribe to the Weird History channel and let us know in the comments below what other hygiene-related topics you would like to hear about. Okay, plug your nose. We're going to Victorian England. Victorians had to do laundry just like everyone else, but they often used more than mere soap to get their clothing clean and fresh. For example, oil and grease stains would be combated by rubbing chalk into the fabric. Grass and blood stains, on the other hand, would be removed with kerosene, while other miscellaneous odors would be dealt with using milk. So far, these all sound like life hacks you might find in a modern YouTube video. But when it came to bleaching their clothes, the Victorians used a method modern folks probably wouldn't be too keen on. They soaked their clothes in their own urine. Mm-mm. Asparagus. It sounds disgusting, but as it turns out, urine contains ammonia, which is a very effective cleaning agent. Except windows. Not very effective on windows. Trust me when I tell you that. Toothbrushes and toothpaste existed at the time and were available to the Victorians, but typically only the middle and upper classes. Most working class folks had to get a little bit more creative. Toothpaste, for example, could be made at home using common ingredients that include things like chalk, soot, or even powdered cuttlefish. Toothbrushes of the era typically had wooden handles, harsh bristles, and weren't terribly comfortable to use. Despite this, they were relatively expensive, and those who couldn't afford them had to find alternate ways to clean their teeth. One common method was the use of celery, which was believed to be abrasive enough to clean one's teeth while being chewed. It was better than nothing, but as you probably guessed, it wasn't a medically ideal way to keep one's chompers looking good. Nonetheless, you'd want to do your best to protect your teeth because the dental care available at the time was, to be kind, utterly terrifying. Many areas didn't even have dentists, which meant if you needed oral care, you would probably have to go to your local barber or blacksmith. The earliest indoor toilets, also known as water closets, were both convenient and popular. But because they predated the invention of indoor plumbing, they had some undesirable drawbacks. With no pipes to carry away the waste, it often just dropped into a large cesspool that was located in the building's basement. While this arrangement was more accessible than an outhouse and less exposed than a chamber pot, the cesspool would eventually fill up. Once that happened, it didn't take too long for the whole house to start smelling, well, like a cesspool. To combat the stank, a cottage industry of night soil men sprung up. These laborers would empty the cesspool and then sell the waste to farmers, who needed it to use as fertilizer. They were known as night soil men because the laws of the era restricted the emptying of cesspools to nighttime, as the task was considered too disturbing to be undertaken in broad daylight. You would think something as simple as how to take a bath would be pretty intuitive to most people. You sit in water and wash yourself. But in Victorian times, that wasn't common knowledge. In fact, as regular, or at least semi-regular, bathing came into fashion, Victorians were besieged by publishers selling books that taught the uninitiated what to expect from a bath. Much of this guidance, though, was non-scientific. For example, one such book advised the curious and unwashed among Victorian society to avoid bathing within four hours of eating a large meal. This rule still exists today, though it's usually applied to swimming after meals rather than bathing. Another tip one might find in these books was to avoid washing their face when they traveled, unless they had the means to first purify the water with ammonia or alcohol. So-called Russian baths, which consisted of washing the face with extremely hot and then extremely cold water, were advised for those who were worried about preventing wrinkles. Today, pretty much everyone is obsessed with their hair. Victorian times were much the same, except that modern shampoos were still a ways off. So how did one clean their hair back then? 
Well, women of the era would typically use eggs. One would crack an egg over their head and then work the yolks into their hair like with a modern shampoo. The egg would then be washed out with a pitcher of water. Another popular option was vinegar diluted with water. Mmm, that's gotta smell morning fresh. Eggs and vinegar weren't the only cooking-related items that made for a popular pre-shampoo hair cleaner. Rum, black tea, and rosemary were all considered normal and effective for hair washing. Cleaning one's hair is important, but maintaining a youthful and vital look is, to many, equally important. The Victorians were no different. To that end, Hall's Vegetable Sicilian Hair Renewer, first introduced in the 1860s, became a staple of the era's hair care regimens. The product's main benefit was to darken hair in such a way that allowed people to hide their gray. Unfortunately for the people who used it, Hall's Hair Renewer used lead as a bonding agent. Its function was to aid other chemicals in darkening the hair, but it had the slight side effect of causing lead poisoning. Eventually, the company that manufactured Halls managed to get the lead out, or at least most of it, in the formula and the product managed to stay on the market well into the 1930s. Most people don't like a bad smell, but in Victorian times, bad smells were considered more than just unpleasant. They were believed to be downright dangerous. The idea that various conditions, including cholera and chlamydia, were spread through pollutants in the unclean air was called the miasma theory, or night air, and it dated back to antiquity. Victorians put a lot of stock in the miasma theory and blamed the poor health endemic in London's impoverished districts on wicked smells that floated through the streets. Even Florence Nightingale, one of the most famous nurses in history, believed it and thought that clean air would restore health to sick patients. While there was a connection between the bad smells and poor health, it wasn't the causative one Victorians believed. Turns out, the poor sanitation that was normal in industrial areas of the time was independently causing both the bad smells and many of the diseases. Victorian hygiene obviously had a lot of shortcomings, but it was also one of the first times in history that mainstream society took the time to address the concerns of feminine hygiene. Indeed, both the disposable pad and the earliest versions of the tampon were invented in the late 19th century. These new technologies took some time to become normal and widespread, and in the interim, women of the era got creative. It was discovered that the wood pulp base used to make the bandages typically used to treat the wounds of soldiers at war were also used for menstruation care. Ask anyone who lives in New York, London, or Hong Kong, and they'll tell you that in the heat of the summer, big cities, even modern ones, can develop a noxious smell. But the stench that emanated from London in 1858 was something else entirely. It was so unbearably heinous that the whole city practically shut down. During the Victorian era, the River Thames used to be the hub of the entire London sewage system. In practice, this meant that most citizens disposed of their waste by simply dumping it into the river. Londoners were not happy, and they raised quite a stink over the foul odors that came from the water. Doctors, in accordance with the aforementioned miasmia theory, blamed the stench for causing rampant disease throughout the entire city. It was so horrible that the summer of 1858 would forever be known as the Great Stink. That's a t-shirt waiting to happen. From bad smells to evil spirits, many strange things were blamed for causing diseases in the past. Among the strangest, though, had to be the Victorian-era theory that tuberculosis and its spread was attributable to women's clothing. Doctors of the era theorized that long skirts dragging along the street were picking up the disease, and women who wore them were unwittingly bringing sickness into their home and spreading it to their families. The theory didn't stop at dresses, though. Doctors of the time also believed that the tight corsets women wore were also responsible for tuberculosis on account of the fact that they constricted the lungs. As such, doctors trying to stop the spread of the disease were prone to prescribing looser corsets and shorter skirts. Very fashionable. Despite being socially unacceptable during the Victorian era, escort work was a very common way for the women who lived in London's most impoverished neighborhoods to make a living. Sexually transmitted diseases were extremely common at the time, and without regular access to contraceptives, 
sex workers often transmitted those STDs to their clients. The clients, in turn, would then transmit them to their wives and anyone else they might be involved with. Things got so bad that the spread of sexually transmitted diseases was eventually declared a public health hazard. Laws were passed that allowed escorts to be detained by police and forcibly treated for STDs. Though it wouldn't be widely marketed until 1914, the mouthwash we know as Listerine was invented by Dr. Jordan Lawrence and chemist-turned-entrepreneur Jordan Wheat Lambert in 1879. Victorians were slowly beginning to accept notions of modern hygiene, so Lambert first tried marketing his concoction as a medical antiseptic. For whatever reason, the product was overlooked and failed to turn a profit for its creators. Not one to give up easily, Lambert began to suggest additional, and often unusual, uses for Listerine. Before he finally hit on selling it as a mouthwash, he tried marketing it as everything from a floor cleaner to a cure for dandruff and gonorrhea. So what do you think? Would you have enjoyed living in the Victorian era? Let us know in the comments below, and while you're at it, check out some of these other videos from Our Weird History.